Hi, and welcome to episode 19 of Understanding Darktable. This week, as promised, we are going to look at noise reduction. As I've said on numerous occasions, Darktable has multiple ways of achieving just about anything you want to do. And when it comes to noise, it's no exception. There's about six different tools you can use. So we're going to dive right in. Just before we start, I quickly want to say this is my second attempt at doing this video. And as you can tell from my on-camera stuff, I have a small soft box up here in front of me behind the camera, which lights my face. And I've got a, another light just over here on the side. And what I found last night when I was trying to do this video was it made it really difficult for me to actually see the noise in the image because my monitor is right in between these two lights. So for this video, you're not going to have the little picture of me down in the bottom right hand corner. OK, so let's dive right on in. So I've collected half a dozen images from various shoots and holidays. A couple of these were shot at 400, I think one or two were at 800, and there's a couple at 6400, which on my aging dinosaur of a camera, my 10 year old Sony A850, uh, 6400 is the highest ISO that it offers. And that's in extended mode. I think the highest native ISO was 3200. And as you'll see at 6400, it's a pretty noisy camera. So I guess the first thing to do would be pick one of these images, jump on in. And the first tool we are going to look at is profiled denoise. Now, this particular denoise module is designed to be a one stop shop, if you like. Now, you'll notice that here under profile, it says found match for ISO 400 because this image, as we can see from the histogram, was shot at ISO 400. Now, it's worth noting that that does not mean that Darktable has a generic noise profile for any image shot at 400 ISO, regardless of camera. No, Darktable has a database of over 200 cameras where there is a noise profile for every ISO for every one of those cameras. So when this says found match for ISO 400, it means, hey user, I've read the EXIF metadata. I see that you shot this on a Sony A850. I've found the ISO 400 noise profile for a Sony A850 camera. And that's what it's deemed to be a match. That's pretty freaking cool if you ask me. Now, under mode, there are two different methods. There is non-local means and there is wavelets. And as we can see from the tooltip, non-local means works best for lightness blending. In the help manual, it says it recommends that you set the blend mode to either lightness or HSV lightness. And if you're using wavelets, you should use a color blending mode. And again, the manual suggests either color as a blending mode or HSV color as a blending mode. So let's have a look at both of those. This is a shoot from a couple of years ago with Nat. Nat's a great male model. If we zoom in close here in behind his shoulder, we can see that there's quite a bit of chromatic noise down here and it's mostly in the reds. Now with these two modes, non-local means and wavelets, non-local means is suggested as the method to use if what you're trying to tackle is luminance noise and wavelets is recommended if what you are trying to tackle is chroma noise. So chroma meaning, you know, colored splotching like this, as opposed to luminance noise, which just looks a little bit like, you know, film grain uh, and is not necessarily color specific. So let's just turn this on in its default mode and see what it does to the noise in here in these shadows. So it's kind of blurred the noise a little bit, but I can still see all this red blotchiness. So what we do need to be aware of is the fact that I have not set a blend mode yet. So let's try the lightness blend mode as suggested by the help manual. So we'll go with a uniform and we'll come down to lightness and let's see what it does. Yeah, really not that much different to be honest. Let's try wavelet and see how that looks. 
Now, what I do want to point out is that if you do not set a blend mode and you use wavelets, your image will end up looking like a Renaissance painting. Everything goes into these big daubs of blotches of color with no detail whatsoever. So if you do turn on profile denoise and you set it to wavelets mode and you get that look, let it be a reminder that you have not yet set a color blend mode and that will make a massive difference. So we'll set this to color and suddenly all that detail comes back and it's not too bad. It's, I don't know whether it's a little bit better or not. Uh, our strength mode defaults to one. That essentially is the algorithmic strength, if you like. So at one, you are saying, this is the default amount of strength for the denoise algorithm. If you want it to be a little less, you know, a little more graceful in its approach, you can set a value of less than one. That will bring back more of the noise, or you can tell it to be a little bit more heavy handed by setting a value higher than one, and that will attack more of the noise, but at the expense of detail. Of course, you can then use opacity to soften that off if you want to. Okay, so that's the first of the six tools, profile denoise. Let's move on to another image and try a different tool. Okay, the second method is denoise non-local means. Again, I was shooting with Nat. Again, he had a gun in his hand. It's a bit of a common theme here. Uh, this was a film noir shoot that we did, again, a few years ago now. Uh, and we'll have a look at his jacket and we can see that there's quite a bit of chromatic noise in these deep shadows. As you can see from the histogram, this was shot at 800 ISO, so the noise is a little bit worse than what my A850 presented to me at 400 ISO in the previous image. What we need to understand with non-local means denoise is that this works on both luminance and chroma noise. Uh, we've got sliders for each of them. The help manual recommends being a little bit gentle with how high you push the Luma slider, but it does say that the Chroma slider you can be more aggressive with. So let's just turn this on in its default settings and see what we get. Okay, so that did a pretty good job of removing some of that noise and it hasn't made a mockery of our facial details here. However, the thing with the non-local means denoise is that it is very CPU intensive. The manual recommends that if you are planning on using this module, that you activate it late in your workflow, simply because once you've activated it, everything else you do is gonna be much slower to respond, regardless of how well your machine is specced. The patch size slider essentially is telling you, as the tooltip says, the radius of the patches to match. So with a value of two, Darktable will look at the first pixel around the target pixel as well as the next layer out from that. So with a patch size of one, you would essentially be looking at the eight pixels around the outside of the target pixel, and that would be all. At a patch level of two, you've got that first layer of eight pixels around the target pixel and then the next layer outside of that, which would be 16 pixels. Again, the strength slider defaults to 50%. You can raise it if you want the algorithm to be a little more aggressive. You can drop it if you want the algorithm to be a little less aggressive. And of course, you can use blend modes if you want to. So that's it for denoise non-local means. Let's move on to the next image and the next module. Okay, next up is the Denoise Bilateral Filter. This particular module is awesome for high ISO images. Although this one was only shot at 800 ISO, the next image I've got was shot at 6400. So we're gonna look at both of these images with this particular module. Now we've got a radius slider. That radius will determine how wide an area the Gaussian blur should cover around the target pixels, right? So a radius of 15 means that it's essentially a 15 pixel Gaussian blur across the entire image. 
We then have red, green and blue sliders which allow us to hone in on particular colour channels. So if one particular colour channel is generating more chromatic noise than the other two channels, we can increase the blur on just that channel. So let's zoom in here. This was another shot from the same shoot as the previous one with Nat, this film noir shoot. And for the keen eyed amongst you, yes, this was a toy gun and the orange cap on the barrel gave it away. I wasn't overly concerned with that because I knew I was going to process these images in monochrome. Anyway, now here in beside Amos' face in these deep shadows, we can see that there is a lot of red chromatic noise. So let's just turn this on in its default mode and see what it does. So that's done a pretty good job. It's removed all of the other noise. There's still a little bit of red noise apparent here. So what we could do is increase the red slider and just try and soften, and that has done a great job. There's still one or two little red flecks in there, but that's done a pretty good job. Now it has softened certain areas of detail in here. Like if you look at her neck, if I just switch that off, we can see that it's actually done a really good job of removing the noise, but we do lose a little bit of sharpness in the process. However, in the areas that are well lit, like across her eyes and her lips and her nose, that's all retained its structure fairly well. Again, we could use this with a blend mode if we wanted to. So what I could do is say go for a parametric mask, leave this in grey values and tell the filter, you know what, I only want you to work on the darkest pixels in the image. Let's have a look at that mask. Well, come on, you've got to show me more than that. There we go. So now what we've done is restricted that noise reduction to only the really darkest parts of the image. So we get all of the detail back in the face because that was well lit. It's outside of this range of input values and anything within that range of input values down in the deep darks is getting that noise reduction applied. And as you can see, that's done a pretty nice job. And remember, we're at a 82% zoom level here. You know, so as we zoom out, we can see that's done a great job. If I disable the module, you, I don't know if you can see it on YouTube after this video has been compressed, but all of this noise came back in these deep shadows. We'll Re-engage that, and that's done quite a nice job. So that's on an 800 ISO image. Let's have a look at a 6400 ISO image. And as I said at the beginning of this video, my A850 does not do this really well at all. Okay, so as mentioned, this was shot at 6400 ISO in Spain on our Europe holiday in 2017. And you can see the noise even with this zoomed out. But if we zoom in to 100%, Oh my God, that is shocking. What am I going to do with that? Well, let's just, before we go denoise bilateral filter, let's try denoise profiled and see what it can do. It's found a match for 6400 ISO for my A850. So we'll turn that on. And that's without setting a blend mode. It's reduced some of the noise, but there's still a lot there. Now, I'm inclined to go straight to wavelets, but let's give non-local means a chance before we go there. So we'll go uniform blend mode, we'll set it to a lightness blend mode, and it actually made it worse. So let's try wavelets, which we will set to no blend at all. And again, remember how I was talking about Renaissance painting? Look at all these just massive blobs of color and there's just no detail at all. So that's no good. So we go to a uniform blend mode and we'll set a color blend mode. And wow, suddenly we got all of this detail back. Sure, still got a lot of noise in there, but that's a huge improvement. Let's now add bilateral filter to that and see what it does. Okay. That's improved it a little bit, but I'm still seeing a lot of red noise. So we'll bring up the red blur. 
and maybe even bring it up a little bit further and maybe even a little further than that a lot of that red noise is now gone I might just bring the green and blue up just a smidge although they are nowhere near as bad now that is starting to blur some of the detail let's just zoom out a little bit if we turn that module off and then back on yep we're getting some blur so in hindsight I'm thinking that the blur is probably a little too much for me to live with so what I would probably do is just back this radius off to reduce the amount of blur but that's still done a pretty awesome job of all the noise that was in this 6400 ISO image if we just jump back before both of these denoise modules just for comparison Wow that's a massive improvement for not a massive penalty on detail I mean yes we've lost some detail but when everything is considered the amount of noise that Darktable had to get out of that image for that small sacrifice in detail I think that's a pretty amazing job and I can assure you Lightroom never went close to those sorts of results on a 6400 image out of my A850 okay let's leave it at that and move on to the next one this is another 6400 ISO image uh, shot in Borneo a couple of years ago again 6400 ISO out of my A850 unlike the equestrian photo that we just looked at from Spain which was shot under appallingly low light this was actually shot under better lighting in my opinion admittedly it was just a naked light bulb on the veranda of the house outside which this kid and his little brother were standing again if we zoom into 100 percent we can see all this intense noise let's try the equalizer and see what it can do now someone on youtube did ask if i could do a whole video on the equalizer and i will actually do that now that i've started delving into it but for now what we want to see is that there are three tabs here luma chroma and edges each of these allows us to address just that particular aspect of an image so in terms of using the equalizer for noise reduction we can approach the luma noise and the chroma noise separately and the way it works is that across the top of this light gray section at the bottom of the graph we've got these six nodes that can be increased or decreased and those six nodes across the top of the graph control contrast but what you can't see is that across the bottom of the graph there's another six nodes which control noise and what we're looking at here is five different zones from the left edge up to this first triangle that's the first zone then in between each of these is second, third and fourth and then the fifth zone at the right hand edge. Now each of these zones basically targets areas of the image according to how much or how little detail there is in the area. So areas like this which in the top left hand corner where there's all this sort of bluish purpley tone and it's all very consistent that is considered low frequency and would all come in this first zone here then as you get to something like this t-shirt here where we've still got reasonably large areas but they do change a little with the folds in the fabric and there's different light falling across the fabric that would probably be second zone and then areas like you know this on his chin would probably be third zone fourth zone would be areas where there's starting to be more detail and then the last zone on the right hand side is where there's fine detail like around eyes and ears and things like that now in order to access those nodes that are on the bottom we simply move our mouse down to the bottom left click and drag upwards and that brings those nodes into view they were hidden at first because they were right on the bottom of the graph but you simply left click and drag to bring them up now 
I will confess that I find this to be a less than effective noise reduction module, but you can see that it is trying to do something with these large areas of noise, and it all depends on which zones you choose to address and how aggressively you attack them. And by aggressive, I mean how far up you pull these nodes. So as you pull this node up, we are targeting these larger areas more so. And you can see that that has tried to reduce some of that noise. I'm not going to go into great detail with this because I think it needs a little bit more explaining and I want to move on to the next thing. However, we can use this mix control to soften the entire graph. As we go for values above one, we are accentuating all five points equally. And as we bring this down below one, we are softening all five or all six of those nodes, if you like, respective to each other. So we're retaining the shape that we've created, but allowing the intensity to be adjusted for all of them relative to each other. But that's only the luminance noise that we've attacked. Really, the biggest issue with, certainly with the 6400 ISO images out of my camera, is chromatic noise. So let's just put that back up there. Let's go and have a look at chroma. And let's try hitting the chromatic noise and see whether we can get somewhere. As we can see, it's tried to do something. I don't think it's the best tool, but there's probably more to using this than I'm covering right now. I will confess I've only spent the last 24 hours trying to get my head around this equalizer tool. You can also choose to use it with blend modes. So you could always start with the preset denoise, denoise and sharpen or denoise chroma to see how any of those might work on an image. Let's try Denoise Chroma and see what it does. Yeah, see it hasn't done a whole lot and it's really only addressed the very fine detail in the image. It's left all the coarse stuff pretty much untouched. So what we could do is maybe just bring those up and then bring the coarse stuff in just gently at the bottom. You will notice that when you mouse over any of these nodes, this large white circle can be grown or shrunk with your mouse wheel in order to expand the range of detail that's affected by that particular node. You can also change where these triangles sit to allow you to focus on different levels of detail within the image. So if really coarse details were your biggest area of issue, you could maybe move these two close together so that this first zone is attacking much more coarse detail if you wanted to. Again, I'm not convinced that the equalizer is the best tool for noise reduction, but it is an option. Okay, let's move on to the next module. Now, the next module is raw denoise. This particular module is applied very early in the pixel pipe. Specifically, it is applied before any demosaicing happens to your image. Now, although there is a demosaic module over here in the basic group, there is no on and off switch. There is always demosaicing happening. You just don't really see it. It's just on all the time. By default, Darktable uses this PPG, which is the fastest type of demosaicing, but there are other options available, and I'll leave it for you to go and look in the user manual if you want to know more about demosaicing. So let's zoom into 100% again. Knowing that this demosaic module is happening already, let's jump back, look at raw denoise, and see what it will do. So it's tackled a little bit of the noise, it sacrificed a little bit of the detail, and all of that happened in the pixel pipe before the demosaic module got to do its thing. Whether or not this works for you or not, that's entirely your call. For me, I don't see a whole lot of advantage to it. I find the 
denoise non-local means and denoise bilateral filter much more effective at combating noise and particularly when you start using them in conjunction with each other and to a certain extent with the denoise profile I think you can achieve really amazing results. All right let's move on to the last module. Now for this one I do have to thank William Ferguson who sent me an email about denoising and he pointed me to a video on YouTube by David Lasavita, who has a video which I will link to in the description. So if you want to go and check out David's video, David's video is quite long and it's only the second half that this pertains to. And it's all about using the low pass module as a denoise option. This is an image I shot a couple of years ago. It's 400 ISO. The theme was comic book heroin. And as we can see, behind Taylor where all of this dark area is again a lot of red chromatic noise. So the way David was suggesting to use this low pass was to set the radius all the way to the minimum. That creates a little bit of a blur across the entire image. You'll see that there are two soften algorithms. There's Gaussian and there's bilateral filter. What bilateral filter does is apply a Gaussian blur across the entire image, but it tries to respect where there are definite boundaries and lines of contrast. So if we were to bring up this radius, we'd see that it tries to respect these hard lines where the Gaussian filter just blurs everything consistently. In this case by 11 pixels. Now David's suggestion was to use a blend mode using the lab A and B channels. Now if we think back to the lab color space it essentially offers us three channels. A lightness channel, an A channel which allows us to work with green and magenta and a B channel which allows us to work with blue and yellow. Now because the noise in this image is red in nature that is essentially magenta so I'm going to go lab A channel and straight away we can see that all of those red pixels have lost all of their color information. So they're now appearing more like luminance noise rather than chromatic noise. If we just turn that off, we see all that red come back. So that's using a Gaussian blur, a uniform blend mode, and the Lab A channel to target the magenta and green pixels. And we just brought up enough of a radius to blur that color information. Now because there's a lot of red in this cape that Taylor is wearing we might want to use rather than a uniform blend mode maybe a drawn and parametric mask which would allow us to mask out that red cape so that that was not being affected by the noise reduction of this low pass filter. Although to be honest I don't know that the low pass is really affecting it all that much. If I turn it off there's a little bit of detail comes back in these fine creases but really it's not enough to impact the overall image. So I'm not going to bother with it right now. Okay that is the six different modules in Darktable that you can use to combat noise. Like I said the real strength is in combining multiple modules together and I think we really saw that with this equestrian image where you know, if we went right back to what we started with which had absolutely appalling noise added the profiled noise reduction with wavelets set it to a color blend mode and then added the bilateral filter on top of that really did a pretty good job of getting rid of a lot of that noise still leaving us with an acceptable level of detail. Now when I say acceptable it's all subjective it all comes down to what you want to do with the image. Clearly this is never going to be billboard quality for an advertising campaign but for printing in a photo book as a memory of a holiday this is now acceptable to me. Sure, it's always going to be noisy, it's always going to be less than perfect. I accept that. It's shot at the highest ISO my camera is capable of. So I was never expecting magic. 
but I could live with this, you know, as a memory of that time and that place, that amount of noise reduction I consider acceptable. Okay, so there you have it. Those are the six modules that you can use for noise reduction in Darktable. Pretty amazing stuff if you ask me and absolutely blows Lightroom out of the water in my opinion. There are definitely people out there on the interwebs who know even more about this than I do. Uh, that's probably not a huge call to be honest. If you are one of those people and you would like to chime in on this conversation, please drop me an email or leave a comment down below uh, and if I can you know, in future videos, add a little more clarity to what I've covered in this video. I'd be more than happy to do so and happy to give you credit as well. Now, I did just want to follow up on an email that I received from Derek Kite. He said, thanks for the help. My question was about pulling the shadows of a subject without changing the sky color. I shoot wildlife and birds, especially against the sky, are a challenge. The darn things keep moving, making it tricky to expose accurately. If the sky is blue, they're slightly underexposed. If it's cloudy, then I need to overexpose the image a stop or more to get a reasonable exposure on the subject. To complicate matters further, I might want to show a series of shots and would like the sky to look the same hue and brightness with the subjects requiring different application of effects. If I change the exposure, I can get the details I want from the subject in most cases, but the color of the sky changes. Here is an example, same session. And he sent me a couple of images to look at. I did a mask on blue sky and it seemed to work fine. Now to figure out the way to get the color right. I suppose a shot of the sky, properly exposed, would give me the color for that day and I use the same mask inverted to apply that color to the sky on all the images. Well Derek, my immediate thinking is I imagine that when you go out shooting you're not shooting first and last image within a couple of minutes of each other you're probably out there for half an hour an hour maybe two hours and i would imagine that over the course of that time the color of the sky is going to change now i kind of get where you're coming from that you would like a consistency to those images but i think you need to accept the fact that it's quite likely that the color of the sky is going to change over the course of the time that you're out shooting having said that what could we do? I would look at the color correction module and the color correction module, let's just jump back to this image of Nat from this shoot. If I was to bring up the color correction module, that's this one here. So if I wanted to target say this wall and I was thinking oh it looks a bit too grey, I wanted it to look more yellow, then I could probably, you know, pull it towards the yellows in here and then use a parametric mask to simply target those tones. Use the eyedropper, click in there, there's the value we're targeting, so we'll bring this up to there like so, bring this down to there like so that should get us somewhere in the ballpark yep probably picked up a little bit of detail here that we didn't want we could use a combination of drawn and parametric to get rid of that area but we've largely picked up the wall that we wanted to and we've managed to move that tone away from gray and a little bit to, towards yellow if that was what we were aiming to do. Now I use this as an example because it's probably close to what you're trying to do with matching a sky tone. So you know if this was sky and the blue wasn't quite the blue that you wanted you would simply drag this around to the type of blue that you were after and how far out you drag it will affect the saturation as we can see in this image here. So we've now made that a blue wall. So I would use that Derek, again, you're probably going to have to draw a drawn and parametric mask in order to restrict that color correction module just to the sky so that you don't go affecting the bird that you've photographed. And 
the good thing about using a drawn and parametric mask is it should also exclude the branches of trees that might be in the image as well. So give that a go, that's my suggestion. If anyone's got other suggestions for Derek, by all means, drop them in the comments down below. And I'll see you in the next one.